Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 43 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. I'm speaking today with Dr. Mark Pruitt, a scholar and lecturer who has taught courses at several universities, including George Mason University and the University of Illinois. He specializes in management and international business. He's also the author of the book, Putin's Boys, The Stamp Men which looks at the history of Soviet and Russian intelligence organizations through what was, to me at least, a completely new lens. Mark documents the true stories of many of Russia's most celebrated heroes who were commemorated on official postage stamps and how the real story of what these men did in service to the Soviet government is drastically different than what is written in their official biographies. But before we get into this story, I want to let you know about a new educational tool you're not going to want to miss. It's the Gray Man Briefing Classified. By now, I think I know my listeners pretty well and take it from me, this briefing is exactly the news and educational reference source that you've been looking for. You'll get breaking news updates from all over the world on topics including planned protests and riots, low intensity conflicts, natural disaster alerts, cyber attacks, supply chain disruptions, and more. You'll also get access to articles that help you build your own skills including urban survival, home security, counter surveillance, escape and evasion techniques, and more. And this is much more than just a newsletter in your inbox. Joining the Gray Man Briefing Classified also includes invitation-only channels on the Telegram and Signal apps for convenient real-time updates. The newsletter subscription is normally just $5 a month, but if you use the code GBCSPYCRAFT, you can save 20% each month for the life of your subscription. I'm already a member myself and have been reading and learning a lot ever since I first subscribed. Look it up for yourself at graymanbriefing.com. That's gray with an A, graymanbriefing.com. And use the discount code GBCSPYCRAFT to save 20% right from the start. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. And thank you. Absolute pleasure to be here with you and your listeners. Great, great. I feel the same way. I, I purchased your book a few months ago. And like I said, I was just totally blown away by this aspect of Russian history, which I was almost completely unaware of before then. So it's, I really appreciate you bringing it to light because your book was like exactly what I was looking for once I started to dive in. Oh, well, I hope we will definitely enjoy talking about it. <laughs> Good. So this book does appear just from looking at your, your resume that it appears to be a major diversion from your previous work. What was it that led you to write a book about the history of a block of foreign postage stamps? Well, there were two parts to that question. The first one is how did I land on this particular subject? And it was from... Uh, one line in the preface of a book that I read a number of years ago, which mentioned some Russian stamps with what seemed to be rather bad characters uh, on the stamps. So I tracked them down and, and uh, bought a set and scanned them in my computer, enlarged them and started looking to see what these people were. That, that's one side of it. The other side is that in some ways, it's not so much a diversion. I've, I've spent most of my career doing three things, learning how to ask questions, how to find answers to questions, and thinking about organizations, how decisions are made, what data people use, and both the the practical and the the human aspects of how groups of people get things done. That's what we do in business, it's what what you do in government, and it's what you do in intelligence work. So those are the two things that kind of combined to lead me down this path. Hmm. Actually, now that you mention it, and once you put it that way, that is kind of a perfect nexus right there. I can see how your previous work would lead right into what would otherwise be kind of a tangent. But it makes a lot of sense, honestly. Yeah, I always have to make that kind of connection to it because it does seem rather it does seem rather far afield at first. Right. Of course, there's nothing wrong with writing about what interests you as well, but it sounds like you found a, a perfect duality there as well. And if I recall correctly, you also have a personal connection to Russian history, don't you? A couple of different ones. I, one of the, my ancestors on my mother's side was involved in one of those interminable wars between Poland and Russia. He was captured and sent off to the very far eastern end of Russia to Kamchatka, to a prison camp there in the late 1700s, mid 1700s. And he 
got a group of people together and killed the camp commander and stole the ship and set off on on more adventures. Wow. Wow. 1750. My gosh, trace it back a long way. He had a rich life. He died when he was 40 or 41 years old. The French shot him in Madagascar. So it was an exciting but a short life. So, but that story had always been in, in my in my mother's family. I mean, everybody heard it as a as a kid. She heard it as a child, and I heard it as a child. And that that always always stuck with us as kind of a kind of a family touchstone. My mother's from Croatia. When I was young, we started going back and forth when it was still former Yugoslavia. I didn't understand it at the time, but one of the first places we went was a little village on the island of Kirk. It was a tourist destination, and but only oh seven or eight miles south was an island called Goli Otok, which, as it turns out, was a prison camp for the communist government of Yugoslavia. Didn't know that at the time. Wow, I wasn't aware of that either, I don't think. So as, as I'm reading through this book, you turned up some really fascinating and very like little known insights into a lot of these figures from Soviet history. And many of them I had heard about before, like I recognize the name at least, but you get into a lot more detail than I had anticipated with their biographies and their family tree and all of their activities with Soviet intelligence, for example. How did you go about researching this book? Well, the very first part was to simply type in people's names and see what I could find. We live in a in a very fortunate time. The internet makes lots of things possible. And although there are lots of, of physical books and things that I can turn to, much of this work was only possible because of the internet. There were a couple of factors that play in. When the when the Soviet Union collapsed, there were many people that, as quickly as they could, tried to start gathering what records were available from the KGB or from the government and finding ways to to copy them or get access to them before that access dried up uh, to try to, to, to publicize and find out what had happened in their own history. Since the country and, and well, not just Russia, but let's say the, uh, the entirety of Eastern Europe has been through so much turmoil in the last hundred years, there is a great personal interest in many people about trying to understand their own genealogy and their own history because so much of it was was either deliberately or accidentally destroyed during war. So there is a great effort on the part of people to document things, to share information about genealogy, to share stories. And so you start piecing things together. Now, it, it's, it's not quite haphazard, but it goes in many directions and you find lots of conflicts and missing pieces and have to start slowly, slowly assembling things and sorting out the sorting out the chaff from the from the chu hui. I can imagine just having done a little bit of uh, genealogical research on my own family, it's it's truly putting a puzzle together with many missing pieces. And so I can imagine a, a foreign starting back a hundred years ago, how difficult that must have been. I did notice that a lot of your original sources in your bibliography are in uh, Russian. Did you just have to translate those online, or do you speak Russian? I don't speak, and I can read it very slowly. And I, I knew a little Croatian as a kid. Now that was in in Latin alphabet, uh, but it was essentially the same thing as Serbian, which was in Cyrillic. And the advantage of of the Slavic languages is if you can follow a little bit in one, you can follow a little bit in the rest of them. Many of the materials I I did the hard way. I would I would re find a book and try to start reading part of it, uh, and what I couldn't understand on my own, I would start translating either on my own or again, using the wonderful internet and Google Translate. The more it gets used, the better it becomes. And I've, I've used it for, gosh, probably 12 or 15 languages at this point. And you start understanding the both the strengths and the limitations of this, this automated translation system. So the, the more you do it, the easier it gets to, to understand what it's really saying, because sometimes the syntax is a little, a little fractured or, or difficult to deal with. Yes, yes. I've, I've run into a few difficulties myself. I did a podcast episode not too long ago about Czechoslovakian STB intelligence agency. And of course, most of the original sources are in Czech and ran into some serious difficulties just trying to automatically translate everything. So really wish I had a, a language capability to assist me with this sometimes. Well, and you can't you can't trust all of the material that you get. I mean, there are many, many transcriptions of things. And I'm being the, the academic nerd that I am, I always try to go back and see if I can find the original document whether that's finding an old book or finding a scan of a of a hundred year old piece of paper. Oh yeah, I can imagine that can help. And I'm sure we'll get more into this in this episode, but you also 
I'm sure you've had to deal with an official history that doesn't really match up with what the documents or the eyewitness testimony says at all. It's a, a glossed over, a cleaned up version, and you have to really parse out the, the wheat from the chaff, like you mentioned. Right. And, and some of that history is some of that history is deliberately distorted. Some of it is simply accidental. People repeat stories that may or may not be entirely true, and those take on a life of their own. So you keep trying to dig back farther and farther to find out, to see, find some original document or original piece of information that'll tell you more accurately the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm certain. So can you take us back? I know that a lot of your book deals with the Cheka, which is an organization that I'm aware of, but I haven't really devoted a lot of time. I was waiting really for the right guest to come along, and now here you are. Can you just talk a little bit about the original Soviet intelligence organization, how they formed and what their role was and their missions? Sure. Let, let's go all the way back to Ivan the Terrible. And he had to create, it was difficult to run a large, a large country and to consolidate it. And so he created an organization called the Oprichniki, which, and their symbol was a a dog's head and a broom. So they were they were the Tsar's dogs and their job was to sweep out or clean up the clean up the problems. And that 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 was sort of the early precursor of what you might think of as as domestic intelligence and and secret police. And that evolved. I mean, we got to where that the in the 19th century you had the Okhrana, which was the, the Tsar's secret police, and they had their their function was like many of the things that you would associate with, for instance, the FBI but they had very few restrictions on their activities. So when the, so when the Russian empire falls apart, the first thing that comes up is the provisional government. And there are different political groups competing. One of them is Lenin's Bolsheviks. And they are not in the majority. And in fact, they're falling out of power, but Lenin wants to pursue his vision of a new Russia. And so he finds a way to do that through violence, creates something called the uh, All Russian Extraordinary Commission for Counter for Combating Counter Revolution and Sabotage, which is a mouthful, and, and spe especially in Russian, and it get, it gets consolidated down to the Cheka or Cheka, or in our case Cheka. So it's just two two initials. It's an acronym, and their job was to it was multi part. It was to deal with a what was legitimately a disintegrating society in which you had you had banditry and violence and and real problems you had people deserting from the russian army which became the red army and that was not an enjoyable place to be so you had high levels of desertion and you had political opponents and to pursue all of these all of these problems the cheka was given unlimited power and it was expressly told to pursue Lenin's objectives through violence. People go along with things when they think their head's going to be bashed in. So that metamorphosized, metastasized into the Cheka as the civil war unfolded. When the Bolsheviks and Lenin consolidated power, they kept it around. They, they, they needed what they thought was an enforcement mechanism to pursue a rather different way of, of, of governing and organizing economic and social activity. Many people were unfamiliar with what communism was, communism was going to be. Many people were not particularly interested in the form that it was going to take. So the Cheka became an integral part of early Bolshevik government. And Lenin and subsequent leaders found it useful. They found it useful to have a rather blunt enforcement mechanism which as time went on, also moved into things like border protection, into counterintelligence, into foreign intelligence, and what we sort of think of as more normal intelligence activities. But it always had that, that fist behind it. Right, and they certainly used that fist a lot, from what I can tell, reading through your book and for, through a few other sources as well. But just, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of, of violence that they brought to the Russian people immediately after seizing power. That, that was kind of my takeaway, but just, just a shocking level of violence that happened right after the Tsar was overthrown. It, it, it is, and, and it worked. We could put in quotation marks, it works in the short run. But the problem is that when you have, going back to the organizational point of view, when you have any group of people that are, that are governed or organized or, or kept in check with the threat of violence, you have to continue that. If you can't get genuine buy-in to ideas, uh, you have to continue ruling with a strong fist. 
The problem with that in the long run is that you have an organization which is fundamentally characterized by violence and fear. And it's awfully hard to get people to do their best. It's awfully hard to get honesty. It's awfully hard to get objective analysis. It's awfully hard to get good decisions when your the members of your organization are afraid of each other and afraid of their bosses. If you, like I am, and many of your listeners, if you've ever worked in a place where your boss tended to shoot the messenger, you learn a couple of things very quickly. Tell the boss things they want to hear. Don't tell them things they don't want to hear. Now, that's great for the boss in the short run and great for their ego and great for their sense of power, but it doesn't help the organization in terms of making good decisions. Right. I can imagine it's almost impossible to, for example, collect accurate intelligence if the person bringing it to you is afraid of what's going to happen um, just when they report <laughs> something that goes against the, the narrative, so to speak. So maybe they were good as, as strong men. Maybe they were good at suppressing revolution, but they would not be good at getting you know accurate information about what's going on and what the people feel, and that sort of thing. Well, if you think that your that your boss is going to either shoot you or send you to Siberia for telling them something that they don't want to hear, that really influences what you're likely to tell them. You know, and it's kind of notorious that that when when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, that some of the people who quite desperately tried to tell Moscow what was happening, they were punished for it. Yeah, yeah, and that was that certainly contributed to the. The struggles that, that that country went through, their government was their own worst enemy in, in so many ways. And it's sad because they were effective in some ways, very effective in some ways, but ultimately it was a, a hollow system was kind of my impression of it, one that would never be self-sustaining anywhere, self-perpetuating. No, and it was it was very interesting because the, let's say the true believers, I mean, the, the people who were generally committed to trying to resolve the problems of the old empire and to create a new system, one of the things that they, they did was emphasize literacy. You had a highly illiterate nation, and in the 1920s and 30s, the Soviet Union made enormous efforts to teach people to read. And so they had a very high literacy rate. The problem with that is, what do they read? then? Do they read things that are truthful, or do they read things that are maybe less truthful? Mm, mm. That's a great point. Yeah, you've got to you got to suppress the flow of information to the people if you're that type of government. And that does that really runs counter to the idea of a goal of literacy. Absolutely. So, Mark, that takes us kind of to the stamp, the stamp men that are the, the subject of your book. So, as I understand it, there was this block of stamps that were printed by the Russian government in 2002, which featured a lot of these original Cheka men and NKVD men, you know, some of the early, early intelligence heroes, as they called them. And, you know, what you found was a, a very, very different story about their activities versus what was written about them in their many biographies on the official Russian site and how they were portrayed on their stamps. So I want to talk about that for a minute or, well, more than a minute, actually. But why do you think that the Russian government chose to not only tell a story that was untrue, fundamentally untrue, but to bring it up again in the first place after almost 100 years? Well, you could say that at first, maybe it was a nice gesture that Putin, who had uh, spent his career in the KGB, became president. So if he had been an, a cosmonaut, an astronaut, we might have put out new stamps for Yuri Gagarin or Laika the dog. You know, so you could you could look at it that way as, to, as simply a positive, nice gesture. You could also look at it as a gesture that it is trying to say that that although the Soviet Union has collapsed and we have this new Russia, which we haven't quite figured out how to run or where it's going to go, but we still have the security services and the secret police to protect us and defend us. Okay, both of those are, are, are reasonable things, but they are, it, it, there's also a third message under there, which is a message about fear. Now, many of these characters on the stamps were well known. They had been talked about for decades, but in rather artificial terms. So it, Vladimir Putin grew up with books and movies about some of these people, ad, as did the people that work in the uh, FSB and SVR. They, they, this is the stuff they grew up with as kids. So, so they, they believe this to some extent. These were, these were popular characters, popular culture stories. And you know, for us, to, we can celebrate people from our past, and we may have a slightly, uh, slightly rosy or idealized view of people. We can have idealized views of 
of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. They, these, they were not demigods, they were human beings. But the difference is, is that basically the things that we communicate about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln are by and large true. These people, their, their real past was quite different from the one that was promoted. Most of these, in the, the 2002 people, most of them were known into popular Soviet citizenry because of their involvement in a couple of counterintelligence episodes or escapades from the 1920s. And, and those stories had been told for, for decades, and there was an element of truth to them. And so you had these idealized characters that people, people believed in. I have no doubt that the people that work in the FSB and SVR and other intelligence organizations and other branches of the Russian government, that there are many of them that are good, loyal, honest, well-educated people um, that care greatly about, about their country. And they believe some of these stories. They may know that some of them are false. I suspect that Putin knows that some of these stories aren't quite true. But again, you have to go back to his childhood, and this is the stuff that they grew up with. There's a very deep emotional attachment to, to things that we hold dear. We know that George Washington did not cut down a cherry tree and, and, tell, and admit to it, but it's still a nice story, and, and it's, it has a greater impact on us than perhaps we might, than we might think. Right. Okay, that makes sense. I can, I can see what you're saying then if he's just really remembering – the I, it would have been propaganda, but he wouldn't have known it at the time if he's remembering the positive light that was shown on these guys and thought, let's just you know commemorate those stories that I recall, not necessarily dig through the archives and find exactly what they did and then celebrate that. Exactly, he grew up with the same falsehoods as anybody else. I see. So, so there's six of these guys on the 2002 stamps, and I want to just talk a little bit about each one of them because the the stories that you found are just quite amazing. Can you start with I think it's uh, Artuzov. Oh, yes. Good old Artur. He was the son, apparently, I have not been able to fully verify this, but apparently he was the son of a, of a Swiss cheesemaker. I have no idea how or why they ended up in, up in Russia, but he, he needed a, a, a more Russian sounding name than, than, than a, a Swiss German name. And his uncle, Kedrov, who's in one of the later stamps, Mikhail Kedrov, was involved in the Bolshevik group before and during the Russian Revolution and all through 1917 and then through the through the Civil War. He was uh, sent off to do various things and he took his his nephew along with him. Ar Ar Artuzov was in his oh, mid-20s, I think, 26, 27 years old at the time. So he follows, goes with his uncle and a couple of cousins, goes up far north and to cement Soviet power, as it as it delicately says, and, and that involved hunting down opponents and fighting against the some of the allies who were, were located in northern Russia at the time as part of part of World War One. So they they go to Archangel, they go out to these famous monastery islands on Solovki, they start shooting the priests, they turn the island into a camp, they set up a couple of other camps in, in the vicinity of the city. And it really sets him on this on this path of 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 intrigue and violence and and gathering information. He becomes as as the Soviet Union becomes institutionalized. Artuzov goes on to become a rather young chief of counterintelligence, very powerful fellow. But it it all traces back to this early involvement with his uncle in in profoundly difficult, profoundly violent times. Yeah, they went to the the suppression of these other groups immediately and by suppression, I should say extermination, essentially, didn't they? And part of that was deliberate. Part of it was simply accidental because there was so little food at the time. Uh, I mean, the ordinary, ci ordinary citizenry was starving. The leaders were hungry. Uh, and of course, so opponents had, had little to nothing to eat. Uh, but a lot of it was deliberately violent of, of if you were an opponent, you were an enemy. You were not somebody to, to debate or to find middle ground with. You were simply wrong and an enemy. That was the problem with, with Lenin's sort of black and white view of the world, that if, if you're not with us, you're against us. And if you're against us, the, the most expedient thing to do is to simply get rid of you. Right. He wasn't really attempting to unite the country under any particular banner. He was just trying to seize power. I mean, I, as I understand it, even the there were a couple of different Bolshevik groups that were at violent ends. Like he was he was shot by someone from a Bolshevik splinter group 
which had essentially declared war against his group, as I recall, in, was it 19... 19- 17, I think it was. Yeah, I guess. I, and I, I can't, her name escapes me at the moment, but but he, he was shot and he almost died. The world would have been rather, rather different place if that had happened. Would have. Oh, yeah. And that was a, that was a very hardcore Bolshevik communist who shot him. And she still thought that he was, he was not the right guy to lead the country. So a very splintered group there that used violence to solve all of its problems. I think you called Arthur. He was the, um, a, a co-founder of the Gulag as well. Like he kind of created that system. There was a dramatic way of describing it, but yes, the primitive concentration camps or prison camps that he and his uncle set up were the precursor of the entire gulag system. They were the first camps organized by the Bolsheviks for the express purpose of isolating and and often simply killing their opponents. As time went on, there were people that ran these things and, and the what became the gulag system that went to Archangel and to Solovki to, to understand how to run things like this. In the early 20s, it was kind of an experiment. Could you, in fact, try to reform people and convince them to see things differently? They gave up on that rather quickly and then turned it into a system of camps which encompassed two continents, Europe and Asia. And that system became more than simply a way of isolating opponents, it became a major part of the economy because they concluded, in the long run, it looks like they were wrong, they concluded that it was cheaper to imprison people and put them to work. The problem was that the the cost of that system to imprison and manage unwilling workers, it cost a lot more than than the benefits that came out of it. They saw it as as an economic benefit but you know, economists will tell you that slavery is the least efficient form of economic activity because of the enforcement mechanism and because people have no enthusiasm for, for work in it. Right, right. I can imagine they're not putting their best into whatever you know, labor task they're being given at any time. And you know, combine that with their poor health and the, and the climate and all that, you, know, you don't get much time out of any worker if that was your original intent. One of the other problems is that as the system evolves, it's not just a question of whether this is a rational way to do things, but that anytime we create a bureaucracy, it's very hard to get rid of it because the bureaucracy has an interest in its own perpetuation. Careers are made, people are fed through work, people get housing through work, people get all kinds of benefits through work. And so the the Cheka or, or any other organization has an interest in in perpetuating its own existence. So it finds new things to do, it finds new enemies, it finds new activities, and it's very resistant to any kind of external change or criticism. None of us would particularly enjoy being told that that our job was redundant or that our organization was not needed or that the way we were doing things was wrong. That is a necessary part of a healthy organization which has checks and balances in it. There weren't many checks and balances on the Cheka, and so its view uh, of doing things became the main view, and there was was no way for society to to disagree with it. That's a fascinating point because you know any like you said any bureaucracy they're really just interested in perpetuating themselves forever, and even a harmless one difficult to deal with or rein in from outside, let alone one that is filled with people who their primary tasks are to kill and to terrorize and to disappear their adversaries. So I can't imagine once they let that. Once they, once they let that dog loose, so to speak, how difficult it must have been to re- rein them back in a little bit. Well, and, and if you look at the history of the Cheka organization, there's some debate as to whether as to whether Stalin slowly poisoned Lenin. Lenin's wife did not trust Stalin, and she did not trust Felix Dzerzhinsky, the, the head of the Cheka. But so nonetheless, Lenin dies, and there comes a question of, well, the outside world is kind of wondering who's in charge of of the new Soviet Union. And there was one particularly perceptive Latvian reporter who wrote that the two most powerful people in Russia after Lenin died were this mysterious Georgian who seemed to have some kind of power that nobody really understood and the chief of the secret police. Well, very quickly, the Cheka becomes more influential, but just as quickly, the head of the Cheka, the founder, Felix Dzerzhinsky, dies. And most historians think that he was probably poisoned. He he got ill during a speech criticizing the organization and Bolshevik government and took him a couple of hours and he killed over dead. 
So once the, the whether it was through accident or, or deliberately, but the, 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 the head of the Cheka was gone, Stalin set about installing people that were more amenable to his influence and power and his way of doing things. So it was his effort to keep the, to keep the secret police a little bit in check. And you saw that later on in, in the mid-1930s, 36, particularly 1937 and 38, when they wiped out most of the leaders of the secret police. Mm-hmm. That's right. It's, it's such a recurring theme in your book and in the, hist- the real history, of course, is that so many of these guys met a violent end by their own people in the end, despite their, their services, despite getting their hands dirty for the government so much, it only bought them a few years in a sense. And most of them, they didn't die peacefully, you know, after 80 years in bed or anything like that. It was, they got their own medicine, a taste of their own medicine in the end. There is a, a quote which, which is attributed to Stalin, and I have no idea whether it is real or not, which says that there were there are two career paths in the Cheka. One is to be promoted, the second is to be shot. Well, the, the history bears that out, certainly, from what I've read. So what about some of these other guys, like uh, Nikolai Demidenko, I think you mentioned, was another stamp man? Yeah, it, Demidenko, he, he's one of the least uh, the least documented, least known people. He was... He was Ukrainian and uh, started out working in the started out in the Red Army and shifted to to tribunals. He was moved to Georgia to help cement Soviet power in Georgia. He's an unusual one in that he died officially of illness in 1934. Doesn't explain why. Now, I mean, of course, people die all the time. Uh, but the strong possibility is that he that he was in fact murdered. He was a fairly powerful uh, individual at the time, working in Moscow, and he had done a lot of work in the late 1920s and early 30s with collectivizing agriculture, where they expropriated, and nationalized all the land, moved people onto large collective farms. You needed a demon in all this, so you picked the kulaks, the rich peasants, and started shipping them off to. Siberia and to Kazakhstan and other places. Well, it, he, he had spent a lot of work on this. And so he was, in fact, very well informed about how it was working and how it was not working. He understood that, that collectiv- collectivization and deportation had lots of created agricultural problems. It had social problems, logistical difficulties, and he knew that it didn't work well. So he was a perfectly good character to, to get rid of at that point. I mean, if you've, if you've done something that, that, that didn't work well, that involved a lot of people, there's a there's an inclination to get rid of all the people that can blow the whistle on you. And a lot of the, quote, old Bolsheviks and the old Czechists ended up dying in the 20s and late 20s and, and through the 1930s. There was another one, this was Olsky. He was a, he had started out as a statistician in the Moscow census office. And he, moved away from that in, into the secret police. But as an example, the, the only census that the Soviet Union did at the time showed that there was this huge gap between the number of people that should be living and the number of people that were living. And it was clearly due to collectivization and to Soviet policies. So they withdrew the census report, shot the people <laughs> In the Moscow Census Office that ran all this, and fortunately, by this time he was he was gone and working working elsewhere. So it was not a place that dealt well with bad news. And going back to that that original point about about organizations and fear, if you can't acknowledge difficulties and problems, it doesn't mean they go away. They're still there. It just means you're not willing to talk about them. But they will eventually make themselves known. Right, right. I mean, it, it seems clear in in retrospect, anyway, that this system was not going to last very long, and it feels like it only did to me, anyway, because of the the strongmen who were in charge that just kept the train running, so to speak. But just just an unbelievable level of self sabotage, government self sabotage, I guess I would say, when you're when you're killing all the census workers, for example, because you don't like the information they're putting out. Well, there was one of the one of the later stamps that was issued by Russia in the last ten years or so. It celebrated a dead pilot from World War II, and perfectly, perfectly uh, uh, good kind of hero to pick. But when you dig through the the history, you, you discover that 
One of the things that he did early on was when the Germans invaded, he and some of his, his, his fellow fighter pilots went up and they started shooting down some bombers they didn't recognize, assuming that they were German bombers. When they get back on the ground, they find out that the bombers they shot down were actually Soviet bombers that nobody knew about. It was a design that no one had told them. So, oh my gosh! So, you, you mean you think again this this information problem where we can't have perfect sharing of information, but we try to figure out how do we how do we communicate up and down in an organization? How do we communicate from side to side? And so here you have people in charge of bombers that have a plane that the people in charge of fighter planes simply don't know about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, man. That's that's tragic. And I mean, it's it's easy to look at this government as a as a as a two dimensional bad guy, but that was some real people fighting for their country that lost their lives. And that's unfortunate, but it's clear that that was not a way that was going to lead to long term success for them. Absolutely not. And we have this debate here. We have it in, in any country, in any organization, whether it's whether it's government and business. How do you share information? What information do you share? And does it go up and down or does it go from side to side, you know, laterally? And it, there's there's no there's no perfect answer to any of this. And this is in part why we have stories. If you work at a place that tells stories about its about its founders, about major successes or failures or or about its culture, that's a way to try to inculcate some long term understanding or, or beliefs that are helpful for the organization. But you still need a way, a, a practical way to deal with with day to day operational and strategic information. And it, it's it's complicated. I mean, I, I've in 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 business school is in management there's there's endless material and discussion about about ways to organize a company and each of those ways has its, has its pros and cons and when you get a new ceo or a new vice president division they, they like to come in and reorganize things because it's one visible thing they can do to maybe to address to some problems to get people to think a little differently and to put their stamp on the place but it's not going to solve the fundamental problems of how do we how do we decide what people need to know and how do we share it? Right, absolutely. So if only the Cheka had realized this and the, and the Bolsheviks early on, things might've been different. So a few other guys still were featured on the stamps. I think uh, Sergei, it looks like Puzitsky. Puzitsky. Yeah, he was, he's another, they're all interesting characters. You know, he, his job was working on mass deportations with one of the other fellows, Olsky. Uh, they deported hundreds of thousands of people from Ukraine and North Caucasus in the uh, 1930 or 31. And he actually did a, a careful study uh, of this exile process, trying to understand um, how to do it, how it worked, what the consequences were. And his his conclusion was that this, this giant forced deportation process was a mess and that it was extremely expensive in human life and expensive in money and expensive in lost agricultural output. It was just a disaster. And, you know, someone like that, okay, he's written an explosive internal report, but it's a good report. It's a factual report and it's an important report. And they demoted him to, to working at a, at a prison camp that was trying to build a, a canal. And he you know, yeah, great, right? So he worked on the canal for a while, and then a week before they actually opened the canal, they arrested him along with everybody else that was in charge of the canal and, and eventually shot them too. So, you know, you take, leaving aside whether what he's working on is is good or bad, here's Columbia, somebody that clearly was was a pretty good organizer and was pretty good at, at, at assessing the, the, the costs and benefits of some, some administrative decision. And those skills literally uh, were wasted. They shot him. Wow. Well, I have to wonder, it's impossible to know now, but did anybody try to warn him off of this report? Did anybody at the office read it before he submitted it and be like, are you sure you want to send this in? Or uh, did he kind of fail to read the room, as we say these days? I'm sure given the world that he lived in, he was probably quite nervous about this. But, you know, at the time, I mean, he and his compatriots, these these people were... I think, by and large, quite dedicated to what they were doing, even if they knew that it had a had a terrible price to it, a, a bloody price. Uh, but he he put his best effort into into creating a, a good report, and it did not turn out well for him. 
you know, that, that sort of blindness to, to consequences really stands out for me for the last guy in the 2002 stamps, Gregory Sarajkin. He was a, a country kid whose dad found a job in Tbilisi, Georgia for a while. He went there, he, he went to school for a bit. He was clearly a bright, motivated guy. The revolution comes along being a former Russian imperial officer in the new Republic of Georgia is not an attractive thing to be. You're, you're the, the face of the former oppressor. So his family goes back to their little village. Gregory ends up in the, in the Red Army. I don't know whether he was conscripted or whether, whether he volunteered. You move forward 20 years to 1937. He is in Spain. He's been working there during the, the Spanish Civil War trying to undermine the fascist opponents. And most of his friends and his colleagues have by this point started disappearing. He gets recalled to Moscow, come back for you know something important. And I've always been su sort of surprised at, the, at his response, which was that he went back. Now, this was a guy who had spent quite a bit of time out of Russia. He knew how to, how to function within continental Europe. He had money. He may have spoken a little bit of Spanish or English or French at the time. I don't know. But he, he clearly understood what was going on, and he didn't seem to have many ties. There were some people from his family from his small town who had already been deported, so they were, they were you know, sort of water under the bridge. And, and I've never really understood quite why he went back to Moscow knowing what was likely to happen. He was the one guy out of those six people who, when when you know, kind of the giant, the giant house cleaning came along, he was the one person that had the perfect opportunity to simply disappear uh, into the Western world and and make a new life. And he didn't do that. He went home and they shot him. Yeah, he he, he just traveled the world. And I have to say, by the way, that the the title that you gave him in the book, the Human Plague, was incredible. What an attention grabber! I actually skipped right to his chapter once I opened the book because I'm like, I have to learn more about the human plague, and I can't wait. Well, and I, th that was that was not my idea. I, I found there was a book written in Russian, and you can translate it either as a plague on humanity or the human plague. And and I, I, I thought, and it was about him. And I, so I thought the human plague was a was a nice way of, of translating it. Right, absolutely. And it, I got the impression that he was pro he probably had a larger body count than anybody else by far out of that original group. Yeah, certainly in a, in a hands-on level. He, he had less education. I think he was more just kind of like the, the rough operational level guy. He traveled around a lot, putting down rebellions and looking for, quote, bandits and gangs, which sometimes those were real bandits and gangs. Very often they were simply political opponents and killing these people. And so he, he had a painfully violent life. He He they all drank a lot. He was the only one that was that was repeatedly demoted or transferred because of drinking problems. So you know that he lived a difficult life, and I, I still just wonder about that 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 decision to go back to Moscow. Was it just was it a some kind of unconscious death wish? I don't don't know. I don't know. Wolf will ever know. After everything he had done, and after everything he had been part of and seen, and all of that, I mean, certainly it must have taken. A toll on him. I don't want to make him out to be some sort of victim. Of course, that's not what he is. But maybe he had, maybe he had seen enough. You know, maybe it was he knew that his time was coming. Something like that. It's hard to put yourself in his shoes. He seems like such an unusual person. And the sad thing is that when he was a kid, uh, he was clearly kind of a, a a big physical, rough and tumble kind of guy. He wanted to be in the circus. That was his childhood dream. And he, he started on down that path, but he got injured, and that knocked him out of the circus. And I've wondered, you know, what would have happened if, in a different world, he had not been injured and he hadn't fallen into this into this new this new world and this new life. He might have gone on to just to be, a, you know, to be a great acrobat or circus performer or something. We'll never know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have been a lot of a greater net good for humanity certainly if he had gone down that path. Before we go on, by the way, I want to take a moment to fill you guys in on the newest tool that I'm wearing and carrying in daily life. It's the Donovan non-metallic knife from Black Triangle. If you aren't familiar with Black Triangle, then you're really missing out. I love these guys because they put the dagger in cloak and dagger. If you've been following me for a while now, then you probably already know why Black Triangle has called their newest non-metallic knife the Donovan. It's named after General William Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the U.S. Office of Strategic Services during World War II. Under Donovan, the OSS was unconventional, unexpected, and highly effective, just like Black Triangle's tools. 
The Donovan is manufactured here in the United States. It's made entirely of G10 composite, and it comes with a thermoplastic sheath and a couple of amazing extras, which you'll have to see for yourself. You can find it at blacktriangle.com. That's B-L-K triangle.com. You can also get 15% off your first order with Black Triangle using the discount code SPYCRAFT101 or by navigating to blacktriangle.com slash SPYCRAFT101. I love mine, and I know you're going to love yours too. So, Mark, that's the story of these stamp men from 2002 and some, some tremendous stories there, some shocking stories, certainly. But that wasn't the end, by any means, of Russia celebrating some of their, quote, intelligence heroes, unquote, because they had quite a few stamps come out since 2002 as well, haven't they? Absolutely. And that there was an interesting group in 2018. And you were just talking about, about Bill Donovan and, and that he sort of points to the to the, the, the different foundation of, of the two intelligence services, the two, the two broad areas of American intelligence activities and Soviet intelligence activities. I mean, here, here's Donovan, a highly educated individual. The ones that tended to populate the Cheka, some of them may be extremely intelligent, but by and large, they were not highly educated. They hadn't read a lot of different things. They certainly hadn't read a lot of different opinions. They weren't free to to discuss differing points of view like like Donovan and the people around him were. So it's just interesting. I find it interesting contrast in the in the the backgrounds of the two intelligence services. Oh, right. It's two vastly different cultures with and they have to go to head to head. And I wouldn't say that they have the same mission, but they're kind of in the same field, at least obviously with covert action and intelligence gathering, but playing by completely different rules with people from completely different cultures and mindsets and leadership and everything. And it's a a really fascinating um, look at how things turned out for both sides there, certainly, but very, very different guys on the OSS side. I mean, as, as you probably know, they're called Oso oh Social because they were a bunch of high class Yale guys and Harvard guys, Ivy League school grads. And, you know, compare them and contrast them to the some of the guys that you were just talking about and some of the others that we're going to talk about in a minute and very, very different people, certainly. Well, and, and you can, in that contrasting, that, that contrast of, of the two groups, I mean, the, 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 the socials are, have their own limitation in, in a, a sort of group think, uh, they, similar backgrounds, similar educational experiences. And so they, they tend to think and communicate and, and behave in not uniform, but fairly similar ways, just as the, as the Cheka and the Soviet ones did. I don't think that Churchill was one of the rare people. I don't think British intelligence really understood the nature of the Soviet Union and of the Cheka. And I don't think that the Americans or Bill Donovan really understood them, particularly since they became rather focused on dealing with Nazi Germany. But the, you know, you mentioned the, the group from 2018, the new group of, of quote, stamp men. And this group was remarkably poorly educated. They were, they were, most of them were young. They were people that, that mostly died during World War II as members of a new organization, SMIR, SMIR Spionum, which was Death to Spies, which was an intelligence effort set up internally as kind of a counterweight or counterbalance to the, to the NKVD slash Cheka. And its job was to deal with the armed forces to look for saboteurs or counter-revolutionaries or, or, or enemies within the armed forces to motivate the armed forces to fight and, and to carry out intelligence activities at the, at the front. So, you know, in, in concert with the, with military forces. So rather different organization and set of activities than the, than the traditional Cheka had. Right. They were not really political enforcers so much, at least among the unarmed populace. I guess these were working every single day with armed soldiers in a you know, highly kinetic environment during World War II, so a, a very different mission, certainly. But were these guys pretty effective at counterintelligence, or were they more of a, like, a, a oppressive arm, I guess I would say, of the Soviet government, like keeping a watch on everybody? Abakumov was the head of, of, of Smir, so we could say he was involved in both in the, the lower-level operational uh, things and in the, the, the longer distance, longer range activities of Smir's. But most of the people that were commanded right on the stamps were, were low-level people working in military units. And we don't have any way to know how they really felt about things. We do know that they, a number of the particularly young ones grew up in, in terrible circumstances, either as orphans or as farm workers in a, in a country which was characterized by terrific famines 
in the 19, late 20s and in the 1930s. So they, they had a tough life, and they may have they may have believed very strongly in 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 fighting off and pushing out the Nazi invaders and oppressors. We, we don't really know, but the some of the steps that that, that Smirish occasionally took were were not particular. We're not dealing with a particularly enthusiastic audience. I mean, the Stalin's quote that it it, it took more courage in the Soviet army to retreat than to advance was true. And it was because you had so-called blocking units behind you, ensuring that you went forward instead of backward. Because if you went backward without command, they, you, again, you got shot. So these, some of these kids were, were probably did really remarkable things, but it's hard to sort out the truth about things. One of them was identified as, I'm to remember, remember who it was, it was Kravtsov. I think he was identified as a, a Soviet pilot that decided to join an NKVD punishment battalion, which if you think about it, makes absolutely no sense. Why would you take a very rare, expensive, highly trained pilot and put them in a, in a unit which was expected to die? That makes no sense at all. When you look at his his portrait the, on the stamp, they they based it, based it off of a portrait in in Soviet materials, which was came from a newspaper in 1945. And when you look at that picture, it's his photograph with a pilot's cap drawn onto it. I don't think he had anything to do with with aviation. But it made a nice story, and it made him into a nice hero. So the the one thing we do know about about these people, with the exception of of Kedrov and Abakumov, is that the the four others really died awful deaths and fighting for something, but but really sad, terrible deaths. So they deserve some kind of commemoration. I'm not sure if if commemorating them as as heroes of the Soviet Union really is the the best way to acknowledge the, the terrible things that, that did happen to them. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, there was so much sacrifice by so legitimate sacrifice, you know, fighting against the um, invading German forces, for example, during the war that it's, I'm sure there were plenty of people that they could, they could choose that died during that conflict, but it's unfortunate that we don't know a little bit more about these guys. Th their biographies are not quite as vastly different than the, the 2002 stamp men. At least that's right. The four of them are, are are younger, and one fellow was a little bit. But there are four that are that are the operational level that died violent lives, died violent deaths during the war. Who was the head of Smirsch? He was shot. That was a different circumstance. And the most interesting one in this group is Michael Kedrov, he, who was the uncle that took Artuzov back in 1918 up to the north. Right. Yes. Um, yes. He had. Back during the Civil War, he had spent a little time in Baku in Azerbaijan, and he discovered that there was a Georgian, or Abkhazian, I guess, who named Lavrenti Beria, who may have been a double agent and seemed rather duplicitous and untrustworthy. Well, Kedrov tried to get him fired and didn't succeed. 30 years later, Beria becomes chief of the secret police, and he, he remembers his grudges. They haul Kedrov in for some kind of, of charges, and they put him on trial. And in a very rare instance of, of, of interesting uh, judicial processes in the Soviet government, Kedrov is found not guilty of, of espionage or, or whatever he was charged with. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's documented. I mean, that they actually, he was a powerful guy. He seemed to have been a, a hero in the past, and they found him not guilty. And ordered him released. Beria simply didn't release him. He kept him in prison. And when they started evacuating Moscow, when they thought that the Germans were about to, to overrun Moscow, they took him and a couple of other dozen guys to the east somewhere and, and, and shot him in a small village. So he was he was rather different than the than the uh, than the other ones. But he pointed to this this real problem in in Soviet governance where you could a judicial system could make a decision. Or even a militarized judicial decision system could make a decision, and a powerful person simply ignored it. Well, especially Beria. I mean, there are some truly horrible stories about that guy. He's only trumped, I would say, by by Stalin himself. Has been my takeaway. 
so far. But the Bolshevik government, you know, they certainly put a lot of absolutely horrible people in power over the years. He was an interesting character. He was it was amoral, and I think he was he was fundamentally a bad person. He was also smart and practical, and he was the one who started dismantling the gulag system as soon as Stalin died, because he understood it partly was a power play, but he also understood that it was a tremendously inefficient way of doing things. People sometimes say, well, you, you find certain characters interesting. Does that mean you like them? And I say, no, it, it doesn't mean that at all. It, but it does mean that they're, they're human beings and they're, and they're complex. Stalin was a complex person. Beria was a complex person. They, they were both awful people, but they were complex as well. Oh, oh, certainly. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, through this project here, this, this podcast and everything, I spent a lot of time diving into the history of some very despicable, but also very effective people throughout history. Like there's, there's no denying that they're out there. Mark, besides these two sets, I think that you mentioned in the book that you found so many more that were um, associated with intelligence operations or intelligence activities throughout Russian and Soviet history. I mean, it was over like 100 stamps have been have been issued by the Russian government, by the Soviet government, kind of celebrating their intelligence people? Yeah, at this point, there's probably close to 200 stamps post-Soviet Union, Russia, that have connections to the secret police. Some are about, about members of the secret police. Some are about projects that they worked on or bureaucracies. And, and quite a few of them are about victims of the secret police. That it's awfully hard if you are an older former Soviet citizen to not have anybody in your past that was somehow victimized by the secret police, whether it was you directly or whether it was a relative or a friend or a lover or a husband or a wife. It's, it's just it's fascinating how you once you start looking into to someone's life, you start finding tragedies and sadness that that occurred to them or to their to their family. Even someone like what an AK-47 is, right? Kalashnikov? Right. Apparently a rather nice guy, neat guy. He invented this, this neat thing that, that you know seemed to function pretty well. But where did he, he get his, his start? His family was deported to Ooh, maybe it was Kazakhstan. His family was deported to somewhere desolate. He as a child really experienced the brutality of the Soviet system. And he go but he, he goes along and he invents this this marvelous weapon for them. Many of their of their more advanced weapons were built in secret laboratories and R and D facilities that were run by the secret police. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I had an early episode. I think it was my sixth episode of the podcast was about Leo Theremin, who was a a musical genius who invented some of the listening devices for Beria, as a matter of fact. And he was a prisoner working in a a prison laboratory, essentially along alongside some other very important, very smart figures. And he did a lot of great work there, but he was also not free to leave ever. <laughs> when, when your city is, has a number instead of a name, that should make you wonder. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's, nobody does dystopia better than the Soviets do, I have to say. So th there were a number of stamps that, you know, like say, since post-Soviet post Union, close to 200 stamps that, that relate to the, the secret police in some way. I deliberately omitted the ones that were st strictly about military activities or people unless they had a some kind of, of connection. The most galling one really was was several years ago it issued in, they didn't have the nerve to issue it in Russia. They issued it in the People's Republic of Luhansk or Lugansk in, in Russian, which was a commemorative sheet for Joseph Stalin. Hmm. I think maybe the Russian post office thought that was a bit too much even for them. Uh, but they clearly, they designed the thing, they printed the thing, and they just put put this breakaway republic's name on it. Well, yeah, even there, he hasn't quite been rehabilitated yet, I guess. So you mentioned almost 200. Mark, why do you think it is that the Russian government, more than any other that I'm aware of, ha has put so much emphasis on their intelligence personnel? Because many countries have done something, you know, one or two or five or six, but over 200 or nearly 200 is, a, is an enormous, very noticeable number. The, the, the Bolshevik organization, when it was young, when the Soviet Union was young, it had a need for, for, for heroes and, and looking for ways to create a sense of, of unity. And people used postage a lot. So what things are we going to put on our stamps? Well, I mean, we do the same thing in the United States. We put, we put heroes on there. We put beautiful, natural 
things. We put famous authors. We put all sorts of positive things that, that convey messages that we want to, to convey. And they, they did the same thing. It's that, unfortunately, some of their heroes turned out to be not such not such nice people. I, I think it is indicative of the strong role that the secret police and intelligence and counterintelligence have played in the Soviet Union and in post-Soviet Russia that we see so many of these of these characters showing up on on of all things postage stamps. Yep, I agree completely. And it's in my mind, postage stamps from any country are are the most prolific type of government sponsored and government approved art. And so it really says a lot about each country each year, what they choose to put on their stamps. And of course, there's all kinds of harmless things. You know, you got, you know, all the different kinds of ducks in the United States or something like that will eventually appear. But, you know, when you see them celebrating these kind of guys or you see stamps that celebrate, like, for example, in in Cuba, there's a lot of stamps about the their victory at the Bay of Pigs in 1961. Many stamps over several different years have been created about that victory. And you really see that what the government wants the people to think about through the stamps that they handle and that they transfer, you know, all around the country. So I think it's a really, really fascinating insight into what's important to a government at the time that they're producing these postage stamps. And so you've done a wonderful job of shining a light on this with your book. Well, it, it, even you look in, in Soviet Union, they put Yuri Gagarin on a stamp. He was the first man in space. That was an incredible accomplishment for the aerospace efforts in in the country and we put the moon landing on a stamp those those are equally positive and wonderful things to to, to celebrate we you're absolutely right we need these 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 stories and heroes and this sort of state sanctioned publicity for stories that matter on that note just as a quick aside i've been looking as much as i can for any american stamps that celebrate any of our intelligence operations or personnel, and there are hardly any. <laughs> Honestly, there's some stamps for Nathan Hale, and you know you could kind of say George Washington, all the stamps. He's our first president, but he was also a spy master, and that is just about it. There's hardly any that really celebrate any American intelligence operatives at any point. Really, it's kind of shocking, actually. Sometimes it's it's good to do things and not talk about them. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. Yeah. A lot of people that deserve to be, but will never be commemorated, that's for certain, and wouldn't want to get that kind of spotlight shine on them anyway. Mark, your book, it's called Putin's Boys, of course. Do you think that, that Vladimir Putin himself, was he directly involved in creating the 2002 or the 2018 stamps? I mean, does he have that, I would guess I'd say, a level of micromanagement for the post office, or is this just something that was kind of in line generally with his vision? I think some of it certainly would have just been generally in line. I mean, he's a he's a, a busy man trying to run a large, complicated uh, organization, government, and, and and country. Some of them I, I were probably done as as again as kind of to, to to honor or to or to to please him without him him necessarily knowing about it. the The one that stands out to me again though is the the Luhansk stamp about uh, Joseph Stalin, and I suspect that that one. That one probably would not have been approved in in a government which is as centralized and top down as that one is. I suspect that that one probably had to have him say, "Yeah, okay, do it. Do it in Luhansk, not in not in Russia." But I, but we don't know. So do you do you think that modern Russians, like your average citizen right now, how much do they know and understand about the Cheka and about the purges of the 1930s? I mean, are these something? Were they potentially? You know, shocked and ashamed to see these stamps come out, or did they not think anything of it at all? I mean, what, do you have any thoughts on that? I, th I think both of those responses are true. It's a large country with a diverse population. Just, just, to, I mean, ours has a much larger population, but we have diversity of of awareness and and of opinions. So, I think some people were greatly bothered by these. The interesting, the guy who designed the two thousand stamps, he had an online portfolio of his work. He's, he's an engraver and he'd been, he was the chief designer for the Russian post office. He'd been doing this for 20 years and he had lots of, of his work on there. And this one he left off, the, the 2002 people, he, he didn't put that on his, on his personal website portfolio. So I don't know if that was an oversight or if that was kind of an indication of how he really, how he really felt, felt about them. Yeah, that, that seems very telling. Did you ever find anything in your research, any 
any articles or opinion pieces, anything like that, saying we should not be celebrating these guys, or or did they were they just issued to little fanfare? Most of them were issued to little fanfare. I think that you know it's like in the states if the somebody sees a new stamp, maybe they go and try to look up who who the stamp is or or what the place on the stamp signifies. But I th but uh, m many of the ordinary stamps that we use, we just put them on and pick them for appearance. The more commemorative and special ones, you know, th those those tend to be bought by collectors, and they're interested in the in the story behind it, whether it's a theme or whether it's about particular people on particular stamps. So, uh, in in terms of how people deal with with the stamps, I, I I'm not sure that that most people think about them any more than we think about our stamps. Right, right. I would say a lot of us are distracted. I wouldn't expect that you can ask most people, even walking into the post office, what they think about this year's stamps. They wouldn't know what you're talking about, but they are issued for a reason. And there were presumably hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of them issued. So I would hope that they would generate some conversation at some level, but you know, who knows? Everything you see, I mean, whether, whether it's a stamp or what goes on a currency or the design of a of a logo for an agency, any of those things, those are choices. And they may have been carefully thought out choices, or they may have been fairly, fairly haphazard choices, but they do represent choices and about somebody's idea of what they wanted to convey. And so then, you know, looking at tiny data, I mean, is, is a stamp important? Well, I, I don't know, but you can certainly, out of, out of a, you know, 25 cent stamp, you can build a very complex story. So I, I think in that sense, those stories do matter. Yep, and that's exactly what you've done. Build out this very complex story from a stamp that measures about an inch wide and an inch tall. And it's it's really amazing. And I really appreciate you coming on here to talk to me about this, Mark, because it's been very enlightening, to say the least. It is an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Is there is there somewhere right now, do you have an online presence if people want to connect with you or learn more about the stamp men? Oh, certainly. The best place to find me is on my website, which is Mark, M-A-R-K-W, Pruitt, P-R-U-E-T-T, dot com. Mark W. Pruitt dot com. Okay. Yeah. Mark W. Pruitt. And... Are you working on any other books, a follow-up report or anything like that right now? Any other stamp projects? Well, you know me. I, I, I like little details and I like ob obscure things. I, As a consequence of working on this book, uh, I read a, oh, what was it, 90-year-old, I mean, literally, literally, the book was physically 90 years old book. And I found a tiny piece of paper that the previous owner had left in it. And that led me down the path of a Nazi spy in the White House. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have to wait for the book. Uh, but I, I, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a teaser. This is one of those little projects I simply did not expect. It started out with this tiny piece of paper, and it leads me to this, this fellow who experiences the turmoil of the Russian Revolution, experiences Soviet prison. His family is dispossessed. Some of them are killed. He ends up working for the Germans. And, and it goes from there. He has an interesting, eventful life. Wow, that's fascinating. Are you anticipating being done with that like uh, next year, for example, or is it a long-term project? I'd like to get that one done by the end of this year. I'm up to several hundred pages right now, and I have to start, have to start filling in the, the blanks and weeding things out. But it, it's a project much like the previous one in that much of it I do either from a bookshelf or from my computer. None of this would be possible without the internet. And that's something I used to say to students. I would certainly encourage it of your readers, that, of your, sorry, of your listeners. When, you're, when there's something that you're interested in, if you start digging carefully through the internet, you can find a great deal especially once you start doing trans, translating terms or concepts or, or issues into other languages, into their native languages, and hunting among their materials. You definitely can. I've seen that myself, and you have to a much greater extent than I have. Well, thank you so much, Mark. This has been really fascinating, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that book. So we'll definitely stay in touch after this. Maybe I'll come back on next year once that book is published. I'd love to hear that story from you. Thank you for your time. All right. Thanks, Mark. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101 or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. That includes a free PDF copy of my own book, Spy Shots Volume 1 101 True Tales from the World of Espionage. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons, including Eddie A and Joshua W. 
With your support, I've been able to continue funding my research and publication across multiple platforms to date. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.